uh, from Cranston, Rhode Island, born and raised, haven't left. I'm 44 years old now. Um, I was 35 at the time of the fire, living at home with my two sons, um, Alex and Nick. I was dating someone um, that I had met through a dating website. His name was Freddie Chrysostomy, and life was good. Fred was a great guy. He taught me pretty much everything about like sports and you know like how to pretty much be a man and be respectful. Rock has been my very big love for a very long time. Started with the Rolling Stones. Just a passion for it. While I was in my marriage, kind of went to the wayside for a little bit. He wasn't into that kind of music. Um, but then met Fred and jumped right back on the bandwagon. <laughs> I never knew my mom as the type of lady that would go out to a club and listen to rock music. Coming from a mother of two who just did nothing but read, even now, like the one thing, the one thing she wanted for Christmas was like the Kindle. Like that's all she does is read. I never knew she was in the clubs. For me, going to the station on February 20th was probably only about the fifth time I had been there. It was fun. It was local, and they played live music. It was all about live music at that point. Um, anyone that played live rock, we were going. Once they said Great White was going to be taking the stage, it truly was body to body, shoulder to shoulder. You couldn't turn around, you couldn't twist around. Um, there were a lot of people. Great White came out, uh, Jack Russell said, said a few words, um, trying to get the crowd going, and they started into the song Desert Moon, and all of a sudden the pyrotechnics went up. Because of where we were standing, Fred had said to me, look at that, something's wrong. There's a fire, there's something on fire. And there was a fire exit, maybe three, four steps to my right, to our right. And Fred just grabbed my hand and we went over to the fire exit. And we got to that fire exit and there was a bouncer standing in the door, in front of the door. And Fred is screaming, there's a fire, open the door, there's a, you know, a fire. And the bouncer just stood there and said, no, the door was for the band only, that it was club policy. We got a few steps without it being this mad rush, but then I think all of a sudden it's when the rest of the crowd realized at this point half the ceiling is on fire, the lights are starting to shatter from the heat. Um, it was just, it looked like a stampede, something out of a National Geographic. It was just, let's go to that door. If you came in it, you knew that door. Fred's hand was on my back at one point, and all I remember was him pushing me and screaming, go. And when I tried to turn around to find him, all I saw were a sea of people and their heads were on fire. It was melting black rain, what I call black rain. Glass was shattering everywhere and people's heads were on fire and Fred was nowhere. And when he pushed me, he pushed me so hard that I actually got made it to the front doorway. But at that point, I was stuck. I was wedged in between other people. And I can remember looking and around and thinking I'm done, my life is over, my breaths were getting shorter and shorter, it was getting hotter and hotter to breathe, the smoke was just, it was just black smoke. And the last thing I remember is hitting the hardwood floor in the club. And that, that's my last memory of being in the club. I was about six years old when the state the fire happened. My grandma got a call and she told me and my brother. I heard everyone in the house, you know, screaming, yelling, like getting all mad. And I, I just, I was only nine, so I didn't get out of my bed. And uh, they had, my grandma had told me that she didn't feel good, so she was going to the hospital. But I knew they were lying. It wasn't until the next morning that they actually had told me. quickly ran out of bed space you know our, our burn service was already pretty busy and we didn't have any you know empty beds so we got uh, beds in the surgical ICUs and the medical ICUs and 
um, you know, all intensive care units throughout the hospital that would allow us to uh, put burn patients there. And I called the uh, Shriners, and they have a, a wonderful hospital here, licensed for children, and asked if we could uh, put adults here. And they uh, very kindly said yes, you know, it's an emergency, and they'd be happy to do that, which is really uh, wonderful. And uh, to my knowledge, it's the first adult admissions that have ever uh, come into Shriners. I met Gina on the day or the morning after the fire. Um, I met her. She didn't actually meet me until a few years later. Um, Gina was in a medically induced coma. I assisted with her care and worked pretty closely with um, taking care of her and working with her family as well. Gina's injuries were quite extensive. Um, she did have third and fourth degree burns, which um, burns down through the skin to bone um, and fat as well. Um, some of the most extensive burns that I've seen um, in my 10 years here. You know, burn patients die for three reasons. During the first, you know, 24 hours, they die of burn shock. They lose a lot of fluid through their wounds and their blood pressure goes lower and lower. The next reason uh, burn patients will die is from infection. Uh, their wounds get infected. There's a lot of dead skin and fat and muscle in their wounds. And then the third reason uh, patients will die is from respiratory failure. If they've inhaled a lot of uh, bad smoke and they basically can slough the lining of their lungs and their lungs no longer will give them enough oxygen. And so uh, respiratory support's an important component of uh, taking care of patients like uh, Gina with, uh, uh, with a smoke inhalation injury. So those three things sort of, sort of happen all together. I woke up 11 weeks later from a medically induced coma. I remember, I remember asking where Fred was, and I just, at that point, was rational enough to say, okay, if I'm alive but injured, maybe he is too. And she said to me, well, he's not here. Fred's not here. And I said, well, what hospital is he in? And she said, no, he's not here. He died. He died in the club. We follow these patients from the day they're brought in till the day they're brought out. Uh, we get very close to the families, we get very close to the patients themselves, and they become part of your family. So a lot of it is from the heart because you know you get to know them so well, and that's an important key piece to it, I think. This fire happened for a reason. 100 people could not have died for nothing. Um, or 200 and some odd of us could not be burned for no reason at all. I need people to know that this tragedy happened. We're surviving, and I'm surviving well. I'm very fortunate and very blessed to, to have the people that I have in my life because of this fire. Um, but I don't ever want the world to forget that 100 incredible people died for a lot of crazy reasons, stuff that should never have happened. There were no sprinklers in the building. Um, exits didn't work properly. We can't forget that. We have to fix the problems before it happens again. smoke. You know when uh, like you get a new toaster and you plug it in and the coils get hot and they start, they smell like they're burning? That kind of stuff bothers me now. Well, during the first band, we were towards, we were towards the back and while there was an intermission, we worked our way to the front. They started playing, they, they lit the sparkler things, and a few seconds later, there was flame. Grabbed my friend, and we started taking off to get out, but because we were so far forward, 
by the time we got halfway out of the building. Everyone else realized it at the same time too, so that's where the bottleneck came into play. Some folks in front of me fell down, and so with the push, everyone else started to fall down too. So I fell, my friend fell, and we're going black, and all the cries and calls for help and the screaming. And then a little less and a little less until it was pretty much just me. at work and my sister called me and she's like this is at seven o'clock in the morning she's like you gotta go find Joe he went to that concert last night and I said okay so I said to work I said I gotta punch out I gotta go find my brother like long grueling hours went by we got a phone call they said we have a John Doe at the hospital I called my sister because she was the closest to Mass General and, uh, she went down and she tried to she tried to ID him but he was wrapped up like a mummy well I'm burned from here up everything you see Because there were so many things that were just wrong. Not enough exits. No way to put out the flames. Just things just should, shouldn't be like that. Tell something was different and we spent a lot more time together. I was by his side the entire time. And we kind of had our first date on my birthday. And he kissed me for the first time. And from that point on, um, we've been together. I used to hold his hand that he had before. But to have fingers to hold, it's pretty amazing. Since I haven't used a left hand in almost 10 years, that part of my brain has been sleeping also. So it's, it's been a lot of trying to get the two to work and to be in sync. He trained for um, a year. We were at the gym six days a week training for this. It's everything from sensory to dexterity trying to make the muscles work properly again even though they were working when it came off of the donor it'll be really awesome the day when i reach over and hold his hand and he says i can feel you that'll be cool basically just wishing that it didn't happen and being glad for the people that are still around that are trying to get on with their lives, like me.
chaos, a lot of commotion. I remember right where I was when you started hearing this commotion on the radio. Well, it's worth talking about maybe more, more rescues we get. At least a couple hundred people with severe burns, at least another hundred inside. And you could tell that whatever this guy was seeing when you heard it on the radio, um, you knew it was bad. We are fully engulfed, fully engulfed building. We have people on fire inside. Fire at rest has to not see. I have always said it. You know, being a firefighter was the greatest job in the world. It's just sometimes you wish you weren't working. My issues and my, my evils from that night are my own. Somehow, for me, it was very quiet. We were relegated to taking our stretcher and going and standing at the front door of the station nightclub and waiting. Uh, and waiting for the next victim. Our stretcher and ourselves, myself and my partner, were standing there watching the firefighters working not 10 feet from us. And they were pulling um, bodies out um, with the ropes. They were reaching in, lassoing them, and just pulling. And as bodies would come out, they would um, they, they had trouble trying to get them to the area that was marked as the morgue, temporary morgue, which was nothing more than a tarp laid on the ground. And the stretcher was in such a way that as they dragged them over the hood of one car, they would use the stretcher for the bridge to get them over to the hood of the other car to get them over to, to drag them over to the, to the morgue area. The rule is pulseless and breathless in a mass casualty are not viable. And the hardest part for me at that point was standing there waiting for a, quote, viable victim and, and watching all of these individuals laying on a top. And they didn't look that bad. As you looked over that night and being in the winter and the bodies were on the ground and they were steaming and, and you would look and you'd say, is that a breath? and you were hoping and you knew you couldn't go over there. You knew you had to stand right there and do what you had to do. You had to wait for someone to come out with a pulse and a breath. And that wasn't happening uh, until, um, until Linda came up. And the young guy just stopped in this look in his eyes and he said, it moved. And I looked and I said back, no, it didn't. And it was the first time I had referred to anyone as an it, but you couldn't tell. You know, you, you couldn't, you, you could see it was obviously a person, but the injuries were such that you couldn't decipher male from female. And then they were arguing that it hadn't moved. And then she uh, just reared her head and made this sound, trying to tell us that, you know, that she was alive. And, uh, and, and I, was, I was like, oh, God. So we got her in the truck, and I remember David saying to me from the front, we're not getting out of here. We were blocked in. Her injuries were primarily head. Her left arm was, was burnt. Pretty much her hand was gone. Her ears were not noticeable. Um, she had no hair left. To my, my disbelief and amazement, when we were cutting her clothes, she reached behind her and tried to cover herself, which meant to me, which told me that she knew exactly what was going on. And the fact that 
she could know what was going on and, and know that she was holding my hand um, was, was I couldn't comprehend because I couldn't imagine, and I hate to say this, but I couldn't imagine the brain surviving that kind of heat in the skull. Just that alone, never, let alone what she inhaled, let alone you know, the, the, the amount of burn she had. So my ride was very, I sat on the floor because her head was down and I, I knew she couldn't see me, but I just wanted somehow for her to know that I was close and, uh, and sat on the floor. And, and like I said, I was injecting her with one hand. I was holding her hand with my other. And then I was praying. And um, I was praying that someone wasn't going to make it. I remember that feeling of just looking at the totality of this young woman's injuries and the fact that modern medicine is where it's at. The potential of her surviving this was, was greater than I had wanted it to be. And I know that sounds terrible, but she needed to be comfortable. We needed to be there. You know, she needed to be out of there 10 or 15 minutes sooner. Or we needed to be there five minutes later. And I'd never prayed like that before. And uh, it's a hard thing to swallow. Even to this day, to imagine <laughs> dedicating my career to helping people and praying on the, sitting on the floor praying that someone would go. It's not something that you usually do. My, my faith has wandered. Um, I have a hard time now thinking of God in heaven. Living with scars since I was four years old, 27 years. The hat that my great aunt had bought me had blown off and landed near the dog who was sleeping on the sidewalk. And when I went to pick it up, the dog like woke up and just pounced on me and pretty much mauled me. I went up spending two weeks in the hospital from age four to I think 13 or 14. I had three or four plastic surgeries, like 400 stitches. I was 31 at the time of the fire. Hey, I'm Robert Feeney from Plymouth, Massachusetts. I was living in Fall River with my girlfriend at the time, and she had two young daughters. We are in the process of planning our future. The night before the fire, we booked the reception hall and everything. Mark Kendall was one of my favorite guitarists. I guess having the opportunity to see him that up close, I was like, I'm not going to pass it up. It was also a night that we had decided we were going to tell her friends that we were engaged. When the band took the stage, we saw the pyro right away. Me and Donna looked at each other and we're like, wow, it's not 1986. 
You know, you don't need pyro in a small venue like this. We're here for the music, not for the flashy show. Just seconds later, I was looking at the wall and I told her from the angle that we were at, we can see just to the right of the alcove that that wall was on fire. I expected it to go out by either sprinklers or a fire extinguisher. So we started headed towards the exit next to the stage and saw the band was jumping off and then uh, one of the bouncers grabbed Donna by the shoulders and held her back into me and told her that it was for the band only and that we had to wait to get out the front door. We probably walked about six steps when the flashover occurred and, and the flames just shot from the stage straight down the other end of the building. The last thing that I had said to her was I'm gonna count to three and I'm gonna get you through the crowd. And I got to two and I was this, we got hit from the right side and it was a body that was burning from head to toe. And fell on top of me, she fell forward. And I just, I don't know who it was, I just knew this person was keeping us from getting out and I just did everything I could to to push the body off of me. And so I just crawled to her and started pulling on her sneakers, trying to get her to move. And she, she wasn't moving, she wasn't responding. I, I couldn't pray to die fast enough. It was as silent as can be. There was no more screamings, no fire alarms. It was this crackling of wood crawled to where I thought the nearest wall was and just I found that and just ran my hand up as high as I could reach and just followed it and followed it until I found an opening and I just leaped up and dove through it. Kathy made it out. Right. Donna Mary and Pam did it. through several phases, I guess, of anger. I went myself a lot. You know, I bought the tickets, I insisted on going. I could say I probably went a good nine months where I didn't have a sober day. I went to a father-daughter dance with Donna's younger daughter. I think seeing the picture of us and seeing how I looked, I think I didn't recognize myself. You know, and most of that was from the drinking. And the look on her face of having me there, it, it pretty much sunk in that there's still a lot more I have to be around for. The worst thing to come out of the fire is the life loss. You know, losing my fiance, two of her friends, and 97 other people. I'll take any physical injury to replace that. Another day goes by that. multiple times a day thought goes through my head just various reasons think about her think about the kids
my daughter, I just figured that that's what mommy's arms look like. And when she was little, it took me a while to figure out why she was doing it. She would take a pen and she would start to draw on her arms. And I couldn't figure out why and I would keep giving her paper, but she wouldn't draw on the paper. And then my father finally figured out and said that she was trying to make her arms look like me. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's not what your arms are supposed to look like. My, um, my grandfather died two days before the station fire and I was originally going to go out and get something to wear to his wake and funeral because I just had a baby so I didn't have anything. And I was going to go with my best friend when I called her. She had already made a commitment to go there so she said, you know, just come, we'll figure out what you can wear later on, just come out with us. We wiggled up towards the front. We were probably about three rows from the front. We joked about how they were squishing us all in there. It was just kind of a, a common thing to know that it was always overstuffed. They came on the stage. The fireworks or pyrotechnics went off and I remember being surprised that they had that. And then I saw in the ceiling where there was a fire starting. So I grabbed my best friend's hand and we looked at each other and we just started to head out. We got probably not quite to the door when all the lights went out. And um, then you could feel like the pushing of everybody else trying to get out. And I got pushed past where the front door was and my friend got pushed towards the door. And I could feel Carrie's hand slipping from me. That's when I knew. You were scared then? Yeah. I got pushed past where the door was, and I just, I vaguely remember when we got there, noticing the big windows, and you could see the people in the bar, and for whatever reason, it stuck in my head, so I kind of, I, or I hoped in my head, I knew the direction of it, and I just kept trying to head in that direction, but um, there were so many people and it was dark, I kept getting pushed down. I could feel um, a weird, tingling, painful sensation on my arms, and I'm sure it hurt more than my mind registered it. I was just focusing on every time I fell down to try and get back up, try not to breathe too much, and to keep heading in the direction that I hoped um, the windows were. I had fallen down and um, strangely enough I was actually gonna just stay there because it was just too much but I knew everybody would be mad at me <laughs> and my dad would be mad and everyone would expect that I would have fought to the bitter end so I rallied and I um, used the wall to kind of get back up. The window was already broken when I got there so I know people had to have gone up before. I don't think many people probably got out after me. And I just kind of wandered over to um, a big snow mound, which was right under the station fire sign that's near the road. And I just put my skin back on and started putting snow on me. And then eventually, I got kind of corralled into um, Coesed Inn. And Carrie's family was there and they had Carrie, but she was like on the other side of the wall. So they kind of correspond between the two of us. One would stay with me, her sister would stay with me, her mom would stay with her, and then they'd kind of switch. Got me in the rescue, and they brought me to Rhode Island Hospital. I had um, inhaled so much smoke, it damaged my lungs, so they put me in a medical-induced coma for six days. Mara Jade was two and a half months the night of the fire. So the only thing that was sad was when I got home, I couldn't, I couldn't hold her really for any length of time. They'd have to kind of prop her up with pillows. So I couldn't really feed her, I couldn't change her. I was a little nervous that I wouldn't, you know, bond. We wouldn't have that bond, but nope, we have the bond. <laughs> so that, that was a little sad, but 
We did good. I got offered 40 bucks and a t-shirt to work for the merchandise table for the band and I said, well, I got in for free, I'm drinking cheap, it's a band that I love. A lot of my friends are going to be here. What the heck, I'll just stay. Driving down Carisset Road, I started to get a headache. Uh, something was telling me, you know, just go home. And I said to myself, no, I'm either going to just go for a little while, you know, we'll have a couple of beers, we'll hang out, and then I'll go home. I just went in like normal and found a friend of ours, spoke with her, found Linda, and was with her the rest of the night. I was actually in the atrium. They had pushed the pool tables back up against the windows, and that's where we'd set the merchandise table. Because I actually wanted to see the show. I didn't want to get stuck in the back corner of the bar. If I was going to stay, I wanted to see the show up close. Where I was standing, there was a pole, kind of like between Linda and I. So she could see partial of the stage where I could see the whole thing. And I saw one side light up and the other side lit up. So to be honest, I thought it was part of the show because they were exactly the same height going at exactly the same time. And I said to Linda, that's not right. I said, let's just grab this merchandise off this front table and throw it behind us, but grab the CD box. We're gonna use this to get out the stage door so no one stops us. We're gonna say, hey, we've got the band's merchandise. And in the few seconds that her and I did that, it was too late to go to the stage door. It was completely engulfed over there. The stuff was dropping from the ceiling. What my friend calls the black rain. You could just see it just falling down. And I said, we're out of time. I said, let's just get on the floor under the table. And that's what we did. So we got down on the floor. Um, I was holding her hand at the time. She stood up, started kicking at the windows. I could hear the bears breaking and people kicking out a window. And I said, we're running out of time. So I told Deb to stay where she was, I'll be back. And I crawled over to the window on my left and I stood up to try and break the glass. Wouldn't break. I was kicking literally to save my life and it wouldn't break. I got back on the floor and just laid next to my friend and waited to die because I knew we weren't gonna get out the front door. We knew there was too many people. We could see the crowd pushing from where we were. God, please take care of my daughter, take care of my husband. Make sure they know that everything was okay, that I didn't hurt, you know, I didn't suffer. Lay there on the floor and ask God, just take care of my family. And at that minute, the glass above my head that I was trying to break broke. I heard the cracking of it. I felt, I heard the window break. I felt the fresh air come in. I felt myself get pulled out, landed on the steps. Linda pulled out, landed on top of me. I couldn't move and my thought was, well, I didn't die in the building, but now I'm going to get trampled to death. So I'm yelling at her to get up. She physically can't get up because she's burnt and I didn't see that. And so I grabbed her by the back of her pants and I guess adrenaline calls and I hoofed her to a standing position and moved her. Kind of stood in shock in the parking lot at the craziness out there because inside except for the bottles exploding and the roar like the fire it was kind of almost quiet inside and then when we were outside it was pandemonium it was like literally an entirely different world and I looked down for the first time I actually looked and all the skin was starting to slough off of my arms it looked like kind of like my elastic here it was all rings of black that look kind of like jelly bracelets or elastics, all just kind of hanging around the edges of my wrists. And I was like, oh my God, how did I not feel that or know that that was happening? And 
just stood there and waited. And then finally my husband showed up and the look of horror on his face. And I said to myself, God, I must be so much worse than I actually feel in this moment. For that look on his face, he was horrified. I saw a lot that I probably shouldn't have seen, but in that state of mind, it doesn't register in your head what's going on. Uh, I wish I had pulled somebody out. I wish I had gone to the door and tried. But my concern was where was Linda? Where was Julie? And where were the friends we knew? And it was just chaos in the street. I don't have any survivor's guilt because I think the way I got out by getting out through that window and the fact that me getting up and kicking at that window is what let the person outside the window at the stairs pulling people out of the door. He heard me, went to his car, got a tire iron, came back, smashed the glass. He saved me, my friend, and like 25 or 26 others came out that window. So I know that indirectly my actions saved not only myself and my, one of my best friends, but 26 others. If there'd been sprinklers, it wouldn't have happened that way. If there was a fire extinguisher on the stage, it probably wouldn't have happened the way it happened. You know, there's just so many, if there wasn't so many people in there, if more people knew other exits that were available. So it's like, you know, if you change one thing in that situation that night, we probably wouldn't have lost 100 people. Early in the morning after the event of the Station Nightclub fire, my technicians had actually recreated from news video the stage setting here in this fire test facility. They wanted to be able to burn and understand what happened. How did it get out of control so quickly? That's what we do here. We do fire protection research. They found very quickly that the foam walls created a superheated gas and caused a flashover event in this facility under one minute. A flashover is an accumulation of superheated gas at the ceiling and when it reaches a certain temperature, all combustibles in the room will spontaneously combust. Uh, the combustibles in the nightclub would be the furnishings, the wall coverings, the flooring material, and unfortunately, even the people. before the, uh, the station event, this fine line fire occurred. And in the fine line fire, there's 120 people in the facility. Pyrotechnics from a band ignited the ceiling. 120 people got out of the building safely for a number of reasons. Number one, it had a fire sprinkler system. Number two, uh, a Chicago incident where there was a trampling death of 21 people caused the owner to meet with the employees the morning before and talk about safety, talk about crowd control, and just preventive measures, just talking about it and telling the employees how to deal with the crowd in that type of an event um, saved a lot of people's lives. Having the right fire protection equipment, 
having extinguishers, maintaining your fire protection equipment, all contributed to why the headline was the band had to cancel that night instead of 120 people being killed or injured. I'm aware that the Station Nightclub Fire did not have automatic sprinklers. It's disappointing because the building construction, the surface finish, the foam that was used in the band area should never have been there. The pyrotechnics should not have been used unless it was permitted and approved by the authority having jurisdiction. It was not, it, but it was still used. So you had, a, you had a couple of events that occurred that combined to create a catastrophic event. Even with that, having proper crowd control, having proper exiting, having a plan is important. Practice that plan. Know what it is. Practice it with your employees. Go through the routine. It has to be second nature to them. It can't be a surprise. Multiple changes occurred as a result of the Station Nightclub fire. One of them was the requirement uh, for automatic sprinklers in existing facilities when the occupant load was more than 100 people. If a facility owner is inviting people into their facility, that they're responsible for the safety of those people and providing the automatic sprinklers is one of those steps. When a sprinkler operates due to a fire event, this is what the sprinkler discharge will look like in that area if it were a sidewall sprinkler. So if the ceiling temperature in the area of a sprinkler gets to 155 degrees, a sprinkler will activate, it will cool the temperature of the air, preventing flashover, and it will discharge water to prevent what's burning from continuing to burn and control it until the fire department gets there to uh, clean up the fire. I, I use the phrase at home, I wouldn't send my children to a zoo that didn't have cages for the animals because it would just be absurd to send my children into somewhere where I knew they wouldn't be safe because the zoo couldn't afford cages. It's the occupancy owner's responsibility to provide the safety of the people coming to visit. They're, they're providing a service, entertainment and they're responsible for the safety, so that's what they should do, is comply with the codes and the standards. And, and sometimes they're confusing. Sometimes you need help. Call your local fire department, call your building department, tell them that you need some help in planning or what to do or how you train your people. They will provide that assistance. If they can't, they will give you someone that can help you. And it's important that the services are out there for people to get the information to do it right.